Okay, this time we're going to talk a little bit about Ethernet. So again, remember when we're talking at the data link layer, who we're talking, who's talking at the data link layer is really device to device. Specifically, um, within a network, we're talking about communication between a device and either directly with other devices or with the router. So we're not talking about communication across the world, but specifically between my computer and the router and then communication between the router and whatever the next step is along the way if that's a firewall or another router that is how the network is set up so ethernet is a data link layer protocol and data link layer protocols handle media access and there's a couple different options for handling media access um, one option, and the, and the option that Ethernet does, is called contention. And what that means is every device is responsible for its own access to the medium, a wire or the airwaves or whatever. And in a contention-based system, basically, because every device is responsible for itself, it has to listen first, make sure the wire or, or medium is empty, and then talk. So it works fantastically for smallish networks. Now, Ethernet's got it pretty well figured out and handles it really well for fairly large networks. But for the most part, contention works best with small networks because they're not going to be super congested and devices can sit and wait and listen for the wire to be empty before they transmit. Now, in a control-based network, this is kind of totally the opposite. Well, okay. Rewind for just a second. The main reason that we need media access protocols is because of collisions. Now, collisions, you, you may not think, you may not have thought before about media access and, and an electronic medium, a wire, for example, or airwaves having interference, but it totally does. In the same way that you and the person next to you can't talk at the same time and really understand each other very well, because the waves, the sound waves that you're creating get mixed up and interfere with each other and everything gets all jumbled up. The same exact thing happens with the radio waves in wireless and the electronic signals um, in a wired medium. So that's why we need these media access protocols because everybody can't talk at the same time because if everybody was talking, no, would we, no one would be able to understand what's going on. So contention is the one method. Control is the other. Now control is kind of like um, the spirit stick at camp. Now this is this is a centralized method for handling communication on the network and there's some central device that controls who talks. Typically um, when we talk about control we talk about something like a, a token ring or a token bus network. Now those are different topologies, network topologies, but on those topologies there's a token that gets passed around between devices and only the device that has the token is allowed to talk. And that's exactly like a spirit stick. Only the person holding the spirit stick is allowed to talk. And the beauty of this and the reason it works so well is because it completely avoids collisions. In a contention-based medium, you might still have collisions accidentally because of limitations of the speed of light and things. But in a control-based network, since the only device talking is the one that's holding the token or that is allowed to speak at that time, you can never have collisions on that network. But the difficulty of that is that then you have to manage that central control and make sure that that's up and running. So there's a bunch of standards. Uh, Ethernet is the main one, and that's the one we're talking about right now. Like I said, token bus and token ring. Now, these numbers, 802.3 being Ethernet, 802.4 token bus, 802.11 you've probably seen for wireless Ethernet. These are standard specifications from the IEEE, the inter not internet, uh, I don't remember. IEEE, doesn't matter what they're called. You can Google it. But the IEEE puts out the, publishes the standards for Ethernet, token bus, token ring, and wireless Ethernet. And that's 802.11, 802.3, those are the numbers of those standards. So Ethernet, how does it work? I told you already it's a contention-based method. And by being contention, well, the way that it handles that contention is called carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. So what does that mean? Carrier sense multiple access means that 
each device is responsible for its own access to the network and each carrier or host on the network senses who's on the network. So, like I said, they listen first, then try to transmit and multiple access, meaning a whole bunch of devices um, and a whole bunch of even different types of devices can be on the network. So first things first, they listen on the network, make sure nobody else is talking. Then if the line is empty, they transmit. Now the collision detection part is still important because like I said, there's limitations on speed and if two devices happen to start talking at the exact same millisecond, we could still end up with collisions because they accidentally started talking at the same time. And the line was empty when both of them started talking and it does happen. So collision detection is what you do if that happens. And we have the benefit with, with ethernet networks that we can s transmit and listen at the same time. So as soon as we have detected a collision, we stop transmitting immediately. And then each device that detected that collision that was trying to transmit on the network at the time stops and sets a random timer. I, the mechanism for setting the timer isn't important. What matters is they basically roll the dice and set a random timer to wait couple milliseconds before trying again and then when it's their turn to try again when that timer's up they stop they listen again because that's always what you do first and then when the network is clear they attempt to retransmit so that could if two devices randomly happen to select the same back off time then they might randomly retransmit and create another collision then they both stop again and wait and then when it's time to Transmit again, they'll, they'll listen first. So this is what an ethernet frame looks like. We've had, we've talked about IP packets, we've talked about TCP segments. This is essentially the header. Well, the header's on the left <clears throat> and the data is mostly on the right. Then with the cyclic redundancy check on the end and we'll talk about what that means. So the first thing is that preamble. Now the preamble is essentially for synchronization. It's to make sure that both devices, both the sender and the receiver, are speaking the same language and their clocks are synchronized, their time is synchronized. So it's 56 bits of 10101010101010101. Get the idea, I don't have to say all 56 of them. And then at the end, 10101011, which tells the receiver that the next thing is going to be <clears throat> the MAC header, the rest of the MAC header. And again, that's for synchronization to make sure everything is, is listening and on the same time schedule so that we know what a one is and what a zero is and how long each of those is in that network transmission. Oh, sorry. And then we've got the destination address and the source address. And those are both MAC addresses because that's the address that the data link layer uses. And then we've got a little bit of information there, the length and the type specifically saying what how long the data is that we're going to have because that's nice to know as you're reading it in so you know when to start listening for the next frame and when that frame ends and then the type is what type of what type of data we have so that's going to be probably ipv4 or ipv6 and that's the information there so that the data link layer knows who to pass it to on the way up who who gets which, which stack what is it ipv4 or ipv6 that gets this data, that gets this payload. And then the payload is all that data. And remember that's the IP header, the TCP header, any header information from the application layer protocol. And then there's a limit, there's a lower limit on the number of bytes that a, a Mac or an ethernet frame can be. And so if you have a very tiny payload of zero or one byte, then you would have that pad to fill out that minimum. And if your payload is at least 46 bytes, then that pad's gonna be zero. And then finally, like I said, the cyclic redundancy check. So the MAC address is divided into two parts. This is kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> so the MAC address is divided into two parts. The first half of the MAC address, the first three um, sets of numbers and letters is the organization ID. And the organization ID is basically who manufactured this device. Because we've talked about it before, but every single network interface has a MAC address. So if you have Bluetooth and wireless and Ethernet in your laptop, then you have a Bluetooth MAC address and a wireless Ethernet MAC address and an Ethernet MAC address. Each of those network interface cards has their own MAC address. 
And each of those is going to have all of this information. The organization ID tells you who manufactured it. Because basically, if you want to manufacture network interface cards, you go to whoever sells them. I don't know, maybe IEEE, I don't know. And you say, hey, I need some organization IDs. And they will give you AABBCC. And that is your organization ID. And then you can start manufacturing devices. And then you can attach those unit IDs and it's a unique unit ID for each device. So AABBCC is your organization ID and then you would start with 000001, 000002, et cetera. Or you could randomly assign it, really it's up to you. But <clears throat> the important thing is that every single network interface card that you create has a random, randomly assigned, or, or sorry, not random, uniquely assigned MAC address. Last thing that we're gonna talk about here is error detection. Error detection is one of the things that the data link layer does, and it's the first layer that does it on the receiving end because the physical layer, again, does basically nothing. It's very dumb. It's not, it's not intelligent, doesn't understand what it's doing. It's just sending ones and zeros. So error detection is how the data link layer handles it and says, hey, something happened with this packet Something happened with this frame, something's wrong, something's changed. So the data link layer, since it doesn't handle reliability, just throws it away. So we have three different ways that we'll talk about here. The parity bit is a one bit method for detecting errors. And it's about 50% accurate. Basically, it, can, it detects an error about 50% of the time. That's not effective enough, that's not good enough for us. A checksum is about 95% accurate. That's getting there. Um, but with, with a few extra bits, that cyclic redundancy check, which is what's on the end of your Ethernet frame, if you look here. At the end of your Ethernet frame, you've got a cyclic redundancy check. And that does some math on the, on the data and then stores a value in that cyclic redundancy check. And then when it receives... When the receiver receives the data, it runs the same math and makes sure that those values match. And if they match, then we assume that nothing's happened. And we're 99.99% .99 accurate there, so we assume nothing's happened. Now, if they don't match, then Ethernet throws out the frame and doesn't care what happens because that's TCP's job or other protocol's job. The data link layer's job, if it sees a frame and something bad happened to it, it throws it away and moves on with its life. Yeah, so like I said, Ethernet doesn't care. If there was an error, it drops the frame and it moves on and that's completely up to the transport layer to handle reliability. And that's the end, that's, that's our introduction to Ethernet. Hopefully that was helpful.